We still have people coming in. I guess there's been tremendously bad traffic today coming across the bridge. So for those of you that made it early, overachievers, we appreciate it. Um, we have a few members of our committee too that are on their way across the bridge. They should be here any minute. But we're gonna get started because we know your time's valuable. So with that, I'm gonna call the order. Can I establish a quorum? Obulian? Here. Cermak? Here. Clifford? Here. Dombrowski? Here. Farrow? Here. Jacobson? Here. Lynch? Here. Nevdal? Here. Nikita? Here. Ron? Here. Stevenson? Here. Sweeney? Here. Todd? Here. Woolsey? Here. Wu? Here. You? Here. Quorum established. We did just have another member come in. Are you here, a member? Harada. Here. Here. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'm going to make a couple points of order. Um, when you speak, please announce yourselves, who you are, before you speak on the topic. There's a little arrow here with a face with, like, noises coming out. Make sure you press on that so they can hear us talk. Um, <clears throat> that'll make it easier for the recorders to capture everybody's conversation and, and also make it easier for people in the back to hear a project of that. So, and the, uh, another item that we don't normally talk about, but people have been doing more of it is they use their laptops while we're working. People should know that they're not using those laptops to communicate about issues um, that we're discussing. They may be just following an agenda because they're more comfortable with the agenda. Uh, being on a, a laptop. So um, the only purpose of using that is to make it easier for them to do their work, not to communicate with other folks about an issue. All right. So with that, can I get a review and approval of the 2000, June of 28th, 2019 uh, Committee Advisory Committee meeting minutes? Any discussion? I was going to say, hearing, hearing no discussion, can I get a second? Thank you. Roll, please. Oh, public, oh, public comment. Sorry. <clears throat> Is there any public comment on the minutes from June? Seeing none. Call the roll, please. Before I call roll, can I have who made the first and who seconded for the court reporter, please? James Sweeney. And Kristen Nevidal is the second. Okay. Calling roll. Babulian? Aye. Cermak? Abstain. Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Abstain. Lynch? Abstain. Nevdal? Aye. Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to our first guest speaker. Um, we we're fortunate enough to have the uh, special advisor, senior advisor to cannabis for the governor of California, Nicole Elliott. Um, unfortunately, at our last meeting, she was unable to attend. There were some travel hiccups, and uh, so now she has the opportunity to come address the issues that we were going to have her discuss with us last time, as well as some additional. So with that, Ms. Elliott, thank you. Good morning, Chair Farrow members. Um, my name is Nicole Elliott. I serve as the governor's cannabis advisor from his Office of Business and Economic uh, Development. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Thank you for extending to me the opportunity to uh, provide you with an update on the governor's engagement in the space all things cannabis in the year 2019. Um, first and foremost, I, th I think it goes without saying that Governor Gavin Newsom is incredibly engaged on many issues throughout the state, um, policies ranging from housing to homelessness, energy, environment, equality, and creating a California that best serves the many diverse communities that reside within our state. 
Um, and it also goes without saying that for him, cannabis represents a unique issue, one he identifies with from his time as mayor in San Francisco, a city that embraced medical cannabis long before his mayoral tenure. And then uh, through his role leading up to and in support of Proposition 64. In light of this, he began his term as governor wanting to ensure that his administration had a consistent focus on the issues of cannabis, adequately supported all state efforts to iterate uh, the regulatory framework as needed, and refine in all implementation of the framework to meet the intent and promises of Proposition 64. I was honored to take this role in late February to support his vision, and it's been an absolute privilege to work alongside many of the individuals sitting in this room today to further his vision. As we uh, entered the first year of his administration, we had three main areas of focus in our cannabis industry related work plan. First, uh, our focus is on creating real pathways to licensure through regulatory and administrative streamlining, enhanced technical assistance, and stronger relationships with local regulators. Uh, second, effective and thoughtful enforcement that contemplates the complexities of a transitioning market, um, the operators and localities, that focuses attention on operators who actively refuse to participate in the legal market, particularly in jurisdictions that have created legal pathways to legal commercial activity, operators who are knowingly causing severe environmental degradation to our state's habitats, and operators creating imminent threats to public health and safety. And finally, establishing an equitable market as a baseline by creating an environment where under-resourced and small legacy operators are given the appropriate opportunity uh, and resources needed to pursue their goals of being a successful business in today's legal market. And just a quick note that you will see these three themes, pathways to licensure, thoughtful enforcement, and equity, uh, as themes throughout the remainder of my comments um, as I outline some of the accomplishments of the state in the last year. And finally, our goal is to do all of this in a holistic manner through an agile approach that aims to remain nimble in response to the ever-changing environment, but that tackles issues in a way that is sustainable for the industry, the community and environment in which the industry resides, and the state agencies tasked with regulating this industry. So first, uh, in looking at the budget for this year, uh, the governor sought to level set everybody's expectations associated with the cannabis tax revenue assumptions. So you saw a significant reset of those assumptions and forecast uh, to $288 million in the current fiscal year and I believe $359 million in the next fiscal year. Yet despite that and for the first time, California received enough cannabis tax revenue to allocate approximately $200 million to priorities not, that had not been funded previously, yet called out in Prop 64. And technocrats speak, we call those tier, tier three funding priorities. Um, and allocations were approximately $120 million to the youth education prevention, early intervention and treatment bucket. 40 million to environmental restoration and 40 million to public safety related activities. The budget also included statutory language that among many things restructured provisional licensing, notably decoupling provisional licenses from temporary licenses to serve as a future step up license for applicants and licensee, sorry, for applicants and localities seeking to swiftly move their operators into the licensed market. Um, it enhanced the equity grant program um, and included a $30 million allocation uh, to support local equity programs. Um, and this was done by the governor as well as Senator Bradford. Uh, it strengthened administrative penalties for unlicensed cannabis activity by adding an, a new up to $30,000 per violation per day penalty that licensing agencies can now levy. 
and it extended the existing CEQA exemption for local authorization of commercial cannabis activity. The changes were approved by the legislature and codified via AB 97, uh, the Cannabis Budget Trailer Bill, in late June of this year. Uh, in, in that same vein, the legislative cycle, <laughs> uh, it was another busy year um, on the legislative front with the legislature putting forward an extraordinary number of cannabis-related bills. Um, the governor signed the majority of the bills that made it to his desk this year, including some that were previously vetoed by the last administration, some coming back in improved forms this year. Um, to highlight some of those, he just recently signed AB 37, which in the absence of federal legalization will allow cannabis businesses subject to the personal income tax, such as sole proprietors or a partnership to claim tax exemptions, such as deductions for ordinary and necessary business expenses for state tax purposes beginning January 1, 2020 through January 1, 2025. This is obviously an effort to support our smaller businesses. AB 1291, which strengthens the labor peace agreement requirements for applicants of any license types. AB 1529, which slightly revised the state universal symbol requirement to allow for engraving at a slightly smaller scale on vape cartridges. SB 34, which recommits the state to compassionate use programs by allowing licensees to designate product as donation for low-income patients and designates retailers as a point of distribution to those patients and exempts those products from state taxes. SB 153, which reconciles state policies with the 2018 Farm Bill and requires the submission of a state plan uh, to the federal government by May 1st, 2020 for hemp. SB 185, um, which prohibits licensed cultivators from marketing their product using an appellation of origin if the product is not sourced from the designated geographical area. And SB 595, which only after appropriation would trigger the development and implementation of a fee waiver or deferral program for needs-based applicants or needs-based licensees by January 1st, 2021. There was obviously extensive administrative action taken alongside um, the legislative cycle. We saw the transition of an extraordinary number of uh, temporary licensees through the extraordinary work of our licensing agencies uh, who over the last seven months have transitioned thousands of temporary license holders to provisional or annual licenses. Most recently, the state licensing authorities have issued over 6,800 provisional or annual licenses, the majority being provisional, um, and that number increases every day. Uh, we are seeing licensees enter the track and trace sy system. Yesterday, our licensing agencies notified a number of licensees that they have, that have to date lagged in getting credentialed into the system, that they have until the end of the month to get credentialed or their license will be suspended. Consider that a second public service announcement. And starting this fall, we've commenced a license streamlining project with our licensing teams in partnership with the California Department of Technology and the Office of Innovation and our state licensing entities. The governor's office is leading an effort to map state agency and industry user journey experiences through the licensing process. Um, this effort seeks to identify internal and ex external strengths and pain points and outcomes of this exercise will be used to inform broader licensing, regulatory, and other implementation streamlining efforts in the future. This is the first licensing streamlining effort of this administration and will serve as a pilot for future licensing streamlining efforts for non-cannabis related industries. 
And most recently, as you are all aware, and as you will discuss next on the agenda, the governor issued an executive order on September 16th to address two distinct issues, the dramatic rise in the epidemic of youth vaping and the acute outbreak of vaping-related pulmonary in injury among youth and adults. Um, among many things, it seeks to reduce, reduce youth access and exposure to vaping devices and direct CDTFA and CDPH to provide the governor with recommendations to increase enforcement and further regulate the production and distribution of vaping devices and the, ta and the taxation of tobacco vaping devices. I know Dr. Charity Dean is present today to provide you with an update on the vaping-related illnesses we are seeing. And I just want to take a moment to commend her and the rest of the CDPH team for their work in response to this crisis and in partnership with the administration. Further, I want to commend the BCC, DOI, and the Department of Public Health uh, manuf Manufacturing Cannabis Safety Branch for their enforcement-related work in this area is the state has identified the producers and distributors of harmful vaping products. These programs have acted swiftly to address them. This is an ongoing issue, um, and through CDPH, the administration is tracking it very closely. To the extent it tests our cannabis regulatory framework, it is clear that the regulatory agencies are nimble and prepared to respond as needed to ensure the integrity of our regulatory framework remains and is strengthened. Um, finally, the state has been engaging and will continue to engage in stakeholder outreach and listening sessions. Most recently, the licensing agencies, partner state agencies, and the governor's office concluded a nine-region law enforcement industry outreach effort. As part of this effort, a number of individuals, including those in this room, have crisscrossed the state. Uh, to meet with local law enforcement, sheriff, police, DAs, and industry representatives to get a sense of the current state of play from an uh, enforcement and compliance perspective. Um, we've also met and will continue to meet with a number of additional stakeholders outside of law enforcement and industry. These conversations have been exceptionally enlightening um, and inform our administrative, regulatory, and statutory efforts moving forward. I may further exemplify this administration's commitment to be a good partner to our local regulatory and enforcement agencies, the industry, and the community. So with that, I know I just shared a lot. I will stop there um, and address any questions that you have. And again, I want to thank you all for the inv invitation to present before you and for your work on behalf of the state of California. Thank you very much, Ms. Nell Elliott. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, Committee members, is there anybody yeah. with any questions? Yes. Mr. Um, Sweeney, please say your name. Yes, my name is James Sweeney. And um, the first thing I would like is, can you make sure that your very thorough presentation can be electronically provided uh, to uh, the members? Well, Absolutely. Well, praise the Lord and pass the biscuits. <laughs> Amen. Dr. Cermak? This is Tim Cermak. Um, the governor uh, vetoed SB 445, which was designed to assure that the monies that go into the Youth Prevention Education, Early Intervention, and uh, Treatment Fund um, would be you would would have a, an overall framework uh, to be used to make sure that whatever programs are funded uh, form a, uh, a remain consistent in a way that can form an actual system of treatment for uh, for adolescents. Uh, what is the governor doing to assure that such a system will be uh, created as opposed to? a collection, uh, often fragmented, of different programs. So for purposes of the allocation of the youth funding in Tier 3, um, obviously last year was the first year that that funding was allocated, as I indicated in my comments. And I know that um, the agencies that are responsible for um, 
allocating those funds have a public driven process to do so. Um, we obviously expect the utmost accountability in that and we'll be continuously tracking that. I don't think that the goals of that legislation as well as the goals of the administration are mutually exclusive. I think that they can be accomplished absent a bill. Any other comments? Questions? No? Well, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the governor and please let the governor know that we appreciate him allowing you to come address us today and give us such good information. And if you wish to come and speak to us again on anything else, please let us know. We'd be more than happy to entertain your attendance. Thank you and thanks again for having me. So do we have any public comment on uh, the last presentation? Any public comments? Seeing none, then I will call our next uh, speaker up, uh, Charity Dean. Uh, she's with our fabulous uh, California Department of Public Health. Uh, I'm not gonna use acting after it, but uh, Assistant Director and State Public Health Officer. And she's gonna give us an update on vaping related illnesses. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning, thank you for having me today. I'm Dr. Charity Dean, I'm the Assistant Director. Uh, we have our new uh, Director and State Public Health Officer here, Dr. Sonia Angel, so I'm no longer the Acting Health Officer, just to clarify that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the vaping-associated pulmonary injury outbreak, review recent data that the California Department of Public Health has put on our website, talk about some of the testing in the laboratories that's being done, um, look a little bit through a crystal ball to try and predict the future of what may be coming with this outbreak, and then talk about public health recommendations um, for the public and for those who choose to vape. Currently, the status of the outbreak is alarming. Nationally, there have been over 1,500 cases and over 33 deaths. That's increasing every day. Nationally, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that of those who have been interviewed, uh, around 76% of them report having used THC, many of them using substances in combination. In California, we now have more detailed data posted on our website, cdph.ca.gov, and it will be updated on a weekly basis. We have had 136 cases which meet the case definition for uh, vaping associated pulmonary injury. We've had three deaths. The median age has been 27. And when I say 136 cases, all of ours in California have been hospitalized. Of those 136, 43% uh, have required admission to the intensive care unit. 28% required mechanical ventilation. Of those cases, 79 have been interviewed. And what that means is that they're interviewed with a uh, standardized form with many questions on it to ask about their social history, their personal medical history, their vaping history, what they used. And so they voluntarily disclose information to the interviewer. And putting all of that information together has allowed us to see some patterns for the California outbreak. Of the 79 cases who have been interviewed, 81% report using THC in their vaping product. 38% report using CBD. 47% report using nicotine. And only 10% or 8 of them report exclusively using nicotine. Most of the cases report using a combination of substances together. So you'll see the percentages don't add up to 100%. This is our website that's up. Um, if you want to go for weekly updates, you can look here. You can also see on there the clinician and provider update that we issued, the health advisory, and news releases that have been issued from CDPH. What we're seeing across the country and in California is multiple patterns of lung injury that are emerging based on the medical findings from the lung washings, from tissue biopsies, from autopsies, and from blood work. These are emerging in the published literature, but are also being discussed and shared um, between the states and nationally as we have these conversations about uh, the pattern of illness itself. 
In the beginning, there was um, a, a certain pattern emer emerged called exogenous lipoid pneumonia, and this was based on seeing uh, lipid-laden macrophages or um, immune cells that look like they have lipids in them on the lung washings. And you may have seen that discussed in the media because the theory was that that could have been caused by inhaling uh, vaporized oil or vitamin E products. And so that got a lot of attention in the beginning. Um, it is something that is being looked at. But what we're seeing now is more buckets, if you will, of patterns of lung injury emerging. Uh, the pattern of chemical pneumonitis, which is a result of a chemical inhalation injury, is something that's also being reported. Um, that includes acute eosinophilic pneumonia, bronchiolitis obliterans, diffuse alveolar damage, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. So that um, family of lung injury is, is known to be caused by an inhalation of a variety of chemical substances that, again, when aer aerosolized and inhaled into the lungs, damage the lung tissue and the immune cells in a specific way and have a specific pattern in the tissue. Um, the challenge with, with the multiple patterns of lung injury emerging is that it suggests that there are likely mul multiple mechanisms of injury and or multiple different chemicals that could be the culprit. And this is really a challenge because from the laboratory testing perspective, one can't just test the substance in a cartridge itself because it's very possible that when the substance is combined with other substances and or things intrinsic to the device itself, that new chemicals could be created. And we don't know what those could be or what effect they could have on the lung when they're heated and aerosolized. And so testing isn't as straightforward as it might be in an outbreak like hepatitis A, where we know the cause, we know how to test for it, we know how to treat it. In this outbreak, we are um, casting a wide net of laboratory testing of the substance, but it's unclear what the cause is, and it's unclear even exactly what should be tested for, what unknown toxins could be created. Um, nationally, of, of the states and our federal partners doing testing, they continue to report that no single device, no device type or product or substance has been identified as the cause. And as I mentioned, vitamin E acetate is being tested for, has been recovered from some products, but certainly not all. The California Department of Public Health um, laboratories are doing extensive testing from um, devices and products voluntarily surrendered by patients in California so that we can test them to try and get closer to an answer. Um, there are many unknowns, as I mentioned, the mixing of substances, the heating and aerosolization, um, variables intrinsic to the devices themselves, all could be contributing to the cause. Now we'll talk about the California Department of Public Health response to the outbreak. The Medical and Health Coordination Center was activated in August, and this is what we activate to respond to an emergency or a disaster or an outbreak so that we as a department can coordinate um, response activities across all of our centers. We're currently activated at level two. We issued KHEN alerts, which are statewide health alerts that go out to, I believe, about 13,000 recipients across the state. We've issued three of those to keep the medical community updated on this outbreak as it evolves. We've issued health advisories both to the public and to healthcare professionals and a press release. And we do get a fair amount of media questions and have been responsive to those as well. We continue to collaborate closely with our national partners, other states, our local health departments, our local health uh, officials, and of course providers on the front line to make sure that the, the information is being communicated um, at all levels. That's been a challenge because it changes every week. Some of the theories are changing, the numbers are changing. Department-wide, the CDPH staff have been called from all programs across the department. I'm going to just mention some of the areas of expertise that are involved. The Manufactured Cannabis Safety Branch, of course, our Occupational Health Branch and Environmental Investigations, the Tobacco Control Program, our Emergency Preparedness Office, who is coordinating the overall response, and physicians have been redirected from multiple programs across the department. Uh, 
the laboratory especially um, has been charged with a challenging task of coming up with chemical hypotheses and new ways to test them and algorithms trying to get closer to potential answer. Um, I'll just briefly touch on the emerging clinical syndrome. I'm guessing that most may be familiar with it from media reports. Um, clinically, patients may uh, present with a cough or shortness of breath, chest pain, may have been seen by maybe an urgent care provider first in the outpatient setting, frequently have been treated with antibiotics because it sure looks like pneumonia. In fact, now we're in flu season. It sure looks like influenza, too. And so they may have already been seen a few times. And by the time they make it to the emergency room, oftentimes these patients are acutely ill and have very low oxygen levels, um, oftentimes require very quick treatment with oxygen, um, hospitalization in the intensive care unit. Their chest x-rays and CT scans um, across the country are remarkably similar. They're show, showing bilateral opacities and infiltrates in both lungs um, in a pattern that's similar across cases, even if the actual um, lung washings or blood work may show different patterns of lung injury. So we're seeing people that get sick very quickly when they present, require a very high level of care, and as we know, many cases um, have ended up being fatal. It is unknown what the long-term health effects are. That's a question we continue to talk about. We're tracking these cases and looking closely at what's happening right now. What we're hearing across the country is when patients leave the hospital and are sent home, even if they have successfully recovered on IV steroids in the hospital, that the um, the course of recovery may appear to be drawn out, meaning they don't return back to a full state of health immediately. Are there long-term consequences on the lungs? Are we going to see a cohort of patients who develop lung fibrosis long-term as a result of this? Maybe that's something that um, public health is looking at at the state and national level. The challenge is this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So for upcoming flu season, you can see how this will start to get complicated when these patients present. And that's why it's so important for us as public health to continue messaging to frontline providers of what's happening so that they know the nuances with which to diagnose and treat a case headed into flu season. So how do we find the cause? We take the same approach in public health that we do for any mysterious illness or mysterious outbreak, and that's combining all the good epidemiology data that we have, the information from the interviews, combined with the clinical picture, the syndrome, the shortness of breath, some have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, combining that also with the laboratory testing. What are we seeing from the voluntarily surrendered, surrendered cartridges? What are we seeing in the devices? Um, it could take a very long time to determine the actual causes of this outbreak, but in the short term, I'll tell you that the state laboratories and at the federal level are working very hard and collaborating and sharing information to try and arrive at an answer as quickly as we can. So public health has some recommendations that we hope the public will listen to. Um, we recommend that the public refrain from vaping no matter the source. There's always a risk when you inhale a foreign substance into your lungs, and the risk of vaping now includes death. It can be challenging for consumers to distinguish between a licensed regulated product and one that is not. And so we really want to emphasize that for those who choose to vape, please only purchase from a uh, verified licensed retailer and, and make that a priority when you're choosing your product, that you know that this is a licensed entity. For those who recently vaped and developed some of these symptoms, they should seek care immediately, and it's really important that they disclose their vaping history, including all the compounds they may have used, the devices that they've used. And if you stop vaping, don't switch to cigarettes. We recommend using an FDA-approved quitting treatment. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, committee member? Uh, uh, sorry, Captain Jacobson. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. It was it was helpful to hear the summary. Um, so, I am a clinical researcher and familiar with how the process works from, you know, from the FDA perspective. And so, I just want to back up a little bit and and give the context here. So, normally, when a drug is developed 
the company responsible for developing the drug has to show the FDA preclinical and clinical toxicology data. And without that data, the FDA won't approve the drug. So in this case, because these products aren't regulated by the FDA, um, we don't have that process in place. Now, based on your presentation, we know that the source of um, the harmful chemical has not been identified. And there may be multiple chemicals involved. So it's my understanding that the process of commercializing vaping devices has bypassed any toxicological testing that's normally required. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are on the, the idea that vaping products supplied by the regulated market are in fact safer than vaping products supplied by the unregulated market. Because it's my understanding that we haven't done any testing on any chemical that is put into these vaping devices, even in the regulated market, um, to understand the effects of those chemicals on the lung tissue of humans. So I, I wondered if you could just address, I mean, the, your final comments were for people to buy vaping products through the regulated market, but it's my understanding that we don't yet know whether those products are safe. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So I will mention the data that's posted on our website as of last week. Of the 79 individuals that were interviewed, only one individual self-reported self -reported exclusively purchasing products from a licensed retailer in California. The other inter individuals who were interviewed reported purchasing their product from street vendors or from pop-up shops or from a location, maybe a brick-and-mortar location, that was not able to be verified as licensed. And so our data, um, again, suggests that the majority of these cases um, are obtaining their product from the illicit market. Um, the question that you asked was, even in the regulated market, um, how would we know, I'm going to repeat it and then tell me if I have it right, how would we know if the compounds that are being aerosolized, maybe even new compounds generated, how do we know if those have a toxic effect on the lung tissue? Um, yeah, that's an important question. What I will say is that if there was a compound identified that we thought should be tested for in the regulated market, we would take action around that. We haven't identified any cause of this outbreak or any culprit um, at this point, and so that's frustrating and challenging, and we're working on it. Um, along those lines, the question has been asked, you know, folks have been vaping for, for years and vaping cannabis, and so this outbreak is emerging now, this is something that we're seeing that's new, or is it new? Is it, are the cases that we're seeing an artifact of us looking for them? I believe this is new. Um, some physicians are looking back at their data, which of course is going to happen during an, during an outbreak. It triggers your memory of prior cases you may have had. But even as cases are being retroactively reported, this appears to be something new. And so we are asking what changed um, either in the devices themselves or in the products that folks are vaping, um, what changed to cause this severe lung injury now? In other words, were, could the culprits of this outbreak have been present before? Or is this something new? Because we did not see this level of cases before. So I know I haven't really answered your question. I think it's partly because there isn't a good answer other than to look at the data and say, this outbreak is new. This emerging clinical syndrome is new. We haven't determined a cause yet, but we do know from our data that it appears that the vast majority of cases are not linked to the regulated market, and we know that 81% of them have vaped um, THC in combination with other substances. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. A quick follow-up question. When you say in combination, are those two separate devices, one containing cannabis, one containing nicotine, or are they... Are they mixing them together in the same device? They are mixing them together in the same device. Patients are reporting a mixture of different cannabis compounds with nicotine, um, maybe even with other substances, but the most common ones we're seeing is THC, CBD, and nicotine. So that, that actually makes me question why, 
why there were, why those are licensed providers, because the regulations clearly state that you're not allowed to mix nicotine with THC. So if these, if 80, you said 81% are reporting a combination? 81% report using THC. Okay. But a high percentage um, report a combination. And if, if nicotine is found in the same vape pen as THC, they're clearly not following the regulations. Right. They should not be licensed. So I think that that brings up the point of, that, so we met yesterday with for the public health and youth subcommittee, and there was a lot of discussion around enforcement and enforcing for, uh, on a number of levels. But, but what I'm hearing today from you means that while these products are coming from licensees, they're actually not following the regulations, so they should not be licensees if they have combination drug products on the market. I don't know that we can say they're coming from licensees. From interviewing patients, what we know from the data is that of the 79, so we've had 136 cases, 79 have been interviewed. Of those 79, only one reported exclusively purchasing from a licensed retailer. And we are still investigating parts of that. Um, these are self-reported, and so there's parts that need to be looked at. Um, but it appears that the rest cannot be confirmed as having come from the regulated market. In fact, some patients report mixing it themselves. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Todd. Um, I was curious about whether the outbreak is happening internationally and if there's any coordination there or is it sort of a U.S. exclusive phenomena and what that might indicate. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. It appears to be a U.S. exclusive phenomenon. Um, Canada has reported a handful of cases. I, I don't remember the last tally, but I believe it was less than five. However, we're not seeing this phenomenon internationally, which has led us to ask the question, especially here in California, why is that? And what changed in the products here in California and the United States that's caused this acute emerging clinical syndrome? This is Katherine Jacobson again, and I just have a comment on that. Uh, um, you, you know, the argument is used that the regulated market is safer than the unregulated market for these vaping devices and products. And I think that the fact that we're not seeing this outbreak in other countries where there are clearly also unregulated vaping pens um, is just another um, red flag to to help us not focus on the difference between the regulated market and the unregulated market. In, in fact, um, Health Canada has recommended that everybody stop vaping cannabis products altogether, um, even though they have a very highly regulated market. And this is because the, the toxicological testing on the multitude of chemical compounds that are included in these vaping products is just not known. Sorry. Okay, um, I have two questions. What, one is, uh, what is the range of uh, duration and quantity that um, people have used who became ill? And the second question is, has there been any study of, um, of users who are asymptomatic to see whether or not there's any early signs? Thank you for that question. So to answer your first question, the range in um, quantity and duration of use uh, for these cases, what we're seeing is that, um, the, so the case definition that we're using includes vaping within the past 90 days. However, um, some cases report having vaped for years before they got ill, and they got acutely ill after having vaped for years. Some cases report recently having taken up vaping. So it's a variety. So what we can say from the case definition is all of them report vaping within the past 90 days, but there doesn't appear to be an 
aha piece of data within that to say that all of them are new vapors or all of them had vaped previously. It appears to be a mixed bag. Um, as far as the quantity used, I don't think I'm going to be able to answer that because I don't think we have that data together. Um, it, it's a you know quantity versus the actual milligrams of a substance. Uh, it's a mixed bag. It, it, what we're seeing is just a variety of combinations. Some of the cases um, reported you know going through two or three vape cartridges a week. Um, and some maybe only one every two weeks, and yet they both ended up with the clinical syndrome. And I'm sorry, what was your second question? Has there been any study of uh, unsymptomatic people? So that has been the important question asked as this outbreak emerged, is um, how will studies be designed to include a control group? We have lots of sick people, but to really conduct an accurate study, we would need to look at those who are vaping, ideally, the exact same thing, who are not sick. And um, I know those studies are being designed right now by researchers across the country, and we're having discussions in California about how to best look at the data. Um, so I don't think there's a good answer for that right now. Our hope is that as studies are designed to get to the root cause of this, there would be some robust case-controlled studies. Part of the challenge is that there doesn't appear to be uniformity in what people are vaping other than the theme of THC emerging. Like I said, at the national level, um, even in from states where cannabis is not legal, you know, they're reporting in the range of the 70s, 76%-ish of people reporting using THC. And so our hope, when I say our nationally in public health, of the, how we would normally conduct an investigation is that really good studies would emerge that do look at people who are vaping the same or substantially similar um, substances who don't develop the syndrome. And why is that? So thank you for that question. Yeah, the variables are obviously incredibly complex, uh, but if we do find any evidence of uh, early disease in non-symptomatic people, that would be extraordinarily important. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ms. Yu was next, and then I'll get you Keith. Oh. Okay, Keith. Like, I have a reaching issue, so I okay. can't just extend my arm out. Like many members of the staff. Do you mind if, and Mr. I, Stevenson, please? I would, I would like to be at least acknowledged with a look to the. I'd look. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Keith Stevenson, how are you doing today? Thank you for uh, coming out. What I'd like to know uh, has is the state, in terms of testing the additives placed inside the vapor pens or the cartridges, is, is the state looking at the additives for their toxicity at the various levels that the uh, cartridges or the oil are warmed up or heated up to, such as mycobutanol has uh, the tendency or is known to uh, cause uh, hydrogen cyanide when burned? And if not, is, is it possible for the state to test these additives at various burn rates to see what the toxicity toxicity is. Thank you for that question. So the state labs are doing um, a number of different testings using all of our capabilities. Um, there are some limitations to what the state labs are able to do. However, they're complemented by other labs nationally that are conducting those testings. For example, this past week, the Centers for Disease Control announced that they will begin doing that testing of the aerosolized vapors of the actual cartridges um, from patients to answer that exact question of when something's aerosolized, is there a toxic compound there? Miss you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Though we may not know the full effects of vaping, um, I just want to remind everyone that the state has far more control over the regulated market than the unregulated market. And it's been brought up, and I wanted to just uplift this comment in the joint committee hearing uh, that the state held earlier, that until cities and counties start allowing for safe, licensed cannabis shops in their jurisdiction, Californians who use cannabis, many who, um, have, who are vulnerable and have medical conditions, 
are playing Russian roulette here. So one of the questions that I have for you is, I know that it's on a case-by-case -case basis with these patients, but besides the tests done on the lungs, has there been a look into blood tests or any tests done on their adipose tissue or, you know, the, the um, kind of the slew of medical tests that are done? Thank you for that question. That is such an important question because, and we've continued to ask exactly what types of testing could or should be done on body fluids. So typically, again, if I were to compare this to maybe a hepatitis A outbreak, we would be able to test body fluids to recover the culprit and, and know what the cause was. Um, in this case, Although many of the local health jurisdictions, hospitals, and providers have collected clinical specimens, up to this point, there has not um, been the ability to test those clinical specimens for anything specific. We could test for broad, broadly for toxins, um, but because the culprit hasn't been identified, um, it's been a challenge to come up with a potential testing algorithm for the clinical specimens. The good news is the Centers for Disease Control is stepping into that space and is able, is, it's accepting specimens from lung washings, blood, um, I think urine and body fluids, to do exactly that, to test for um, specific toxins, um, to look at the case that got ill and see if there are potential culprits that they can identify. So we, California Department of Public Health, are working closely with them and with local health jurisdictions um, to make sure that those specimens are able to be sent for testing and then looking at the results from them. We hope to have more information to share in the future. We're still really in the beginning stages of that. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so, please state your name. Yes, my name is James Sweeney. Uh, can you give us a breakdown of the kind of constituents? Um, did you say 136? Um, and then you said 79 were. Okay, so like, are they younger? Are they older? Do they have a history of smoking versus non-smoking, uh, you know, have, do you have any data? Maybe it's, it, it, maybe you don't have enough data to make any coherent generalizations. Uh, but I am, I am concerned about who, who's being tested. Are they mostly women? Are they mostly Men, are there different effects depending upon? So, so can you tell me a little bit about the distribution of persons uh, that you were uh, 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 looking at? Thank you for that question. Um, yes, and I, if our CDPH website could be pulled up again, I want to show everyone where to click to go on that exact updated information every week. So if you go to the VP Weekly Update Report and click right there, we will be updating this information, which in includes some of that demographic um, information every week as it becomes available. To answer your question about um, sex. So as of this week, 63% of the cases are male, 37% are female. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the age range. The youngest case in California was 14 years old. The oldest one was 70. The median age is 27 years. Here's the severity of illness broken out by age range. Um, your question is very astute. We asked that same question. Are different um, age ranges or different demographics being disproportionately impacted by this. And so you'll see that the majority of, of cases um, admitted to the intensive care unit, for example, were over age 26. And if you keep scrolling down, I think there's a little bit more detail. Here we go. So there's the breakout by age. 75% of the cases report uh, identify as being white. 14% is other. 1% is Asian Pacific Islander. 4% is black. Um, 
ethnicity, 44% a report um, Hispanic and 52% non-Hispanic. There were a few declined to state. And so then down further, you'll see the breakdown of the vaping products reported. This is gonna change every week. Um, Again, our, our data is changing quickly, but we are looking at some of those issues. And then to your question of um, how many maybe had a smoking history of cigarettes, mm -hmm. I don't have that information in front of you, but it is part of what we're gathering and looking at. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is Ben with speaking. Um, just I think it would help answer a lot of questions. Is it possible to share a blank copy of that survey or that questionnaire that you interview people for because understanding what questions are being asked would certainly help us, you know, I think at least get a little closer to, to figuring things out here. Um, you know, one question I had is, are you focused exclusively on vape or are you asking people if they do other forms of concentrates, you know, because that could also lead to a different school of thought. Um, you know, you mentioned that you, you guys believe it is something that is relatively new, right? Um, and, and that that certainly a big question in my mind. Is, is it new or is it just because we're looking for it? Um, so I think seeing that that questionnaire would help. Um, and then secondly, is, you know, I assume you're very engaged in talking to manufacturers to understand or how engaged are you with actual manufacturers to understand this problem? The role of the California Department of Public Health has really been to investigate the outbreak cases and to respond to them. We do have the manufactured cannabis safety branch within CDPH, but as part of our investigation into this outbreak, we are really staying in the um, realm of coordinating with local public health, coordinating with national public health, and really staying to that issue. So, to, and that's in response to your question, are we in conversations with manufacturers? Okay, I would, you know, I certainly would encourage that level because I think you'd get, to, you, it might help get to the answer quicker if you're able to work with people and understand what they're doing. Um, I'm sure, you know, Keith Stevenson has, you know, thoughts and, and I have thoughts and I'm sure other industry players also have their suspicions, so. And in response to your question, I'm happy to see if we can share a copy of the um, interview form. It's very, very long. It includes a number of questions, social history, substances. Love to see it. Thank you. Um, Kristen Navidal, um, going back to some of the demographics, I, I didn't see it on there, but are you capturing like um, where the folks that are falling ill um, reside, so what communities they're in, and are you seeing concentrations in areas of the state with illness? Thank you for that question. Yes, we are tracking that. We're tracking where the cases reside, where they purchase their product. Um, we're tracking all of that. We're, it's, we're seeing cases across the state, northern, central, southern California. We are not sharing the county level or city level data at this time. Uh, it's changing quickly. Um, but we are certainly looking at that closely and working closely with those counties' public health departments that have the most cases. So we are aware of where the cases reside and where they're purchasing from. And then just a, a second question. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, the substances are, are getting mixed by, by whom? Is it the um, consumer or is this happening at the place of purchase? Do we know? I'm just a little curious about that. Thank you for that question. Um, it's both. Patients are reporting having purchased from a friend or a social contact, and they'll report what they think was in it. Some patients report mixing it themselves, mixing things together to put in their refillable cartridges. Um, and so that's been part of the challenge is in some states, they are actually um, comparing what the patient thinks was in it with what was actually tested in it, and they're not always the same. And so the reports that we have are the self-reports from patients of what they think they were vaping. And so they, you know, some will report purchasing from a pop-up shop or a street vendor, and they'll think they're purchasing something that maybe is a mixture of nicotine and THC. So many of those are coming from informal, unregulated sources. Well, I have a few too. So um, but there was a question. Do we know if the one person who reported just from buying from a legal 
shop, whether they're including that as tobacco, because that was in that mix. So could it have been a, a tobacco product that they bought or a CBD product that they bought from a drugstore that isn't maybe going through the testing that's going on? Do we know that, first of all? Uh, that investigation of what the actual product was is still ongoing, and I'm not able to share any details. Sure, okay. But I do know that that's a possibility then. Um, one thing that we always want to check into is it sounds like all the gov all the state governments and federal government are now engaged but is there funding that's a challenge for us here you obviously you know you talk to enforcement enforcement never gets enough money and um our health groups never have enough money is there a funding challenge and, and i would break that down to there's the other important of having a regulated market versus a non-regulated market the non-regulated illegal market is not paying any taxes to the state that would help to tackle this issue where the regulated market at least through its tax scheme of the state is putting money in that is designated directly to public health um, is there a funding stream issue here for getting to this any quicker or providing any of the testing or hiring any of the subject matter experts or although you're very talented i, I was just saying yeah that very, thank you for the question yeah. um I'm probably not the best person to speak to funding of law enforcement, although I know those discussions have happened elsewhere. I'll say that in public health, we are well positioned and well equipped to respond to an outbreak of an unknown substance and unknown cause. Um, we have a robust infrastructure across our environmental health center, our center for healthy communities, our emergency re response, our laboratories. So this is a core role of public health. We feel well equipped and well positioned to do that. And we don't do it alone. We do it in partnership with the Bureau of Cannabis Control and with our other sister departments in the state. Um, so our robust response has been because we have been well equipped and well positioned to do that. I don't know that I can speak to the larger issue that you brought up of yeah. the illicit market, but those are my thoughts for public health. And then I would say, I know that we've got a actually pretty robust testing requirement for anybody within the cannabis space licensing, but I would imagine there were other things that we could start to test for that they aren't. Have you guys contemplating on what you'd like them to start testing for as well? I know that many of my conversations with testing labs say they have the capacity, but they're not asked to test for these other things, the inner objects and stuff that are in the, so like you said, is that they're testing for THC, heavy metals, all those kind of things, but you know, using these other products that are not normally considered part of the testing regime might be interesting. Um, have you looked into that or have any thoughts on that? There are, those conversations are taking place. Again, the challenge here is we don't even have a leading theory of what's causing this. And so when we do, when we can say with confidence that we have a leading theory even of what the suspicious compounds are, of course we would want to look at all options to make sure that the regulated market is safe. Okay, and I think the last part I'd go back and kind of back up Mr. Wu's comment that uh, we should be talking to the manufacturers. Um, you know, we don't know within the last several months who new to the market cartridges out and they're all taking advantage because there's a reduction of cost and because of the taxation, they want to find a way to cut those pennies and maybe it's, you know, a degradation of the heating element or something that's generating these problems. Maybe they're, some of them are heating higher and the higher heats are causing the release of, ex, you know, gases, like you said, that weren't. And I think they would be the ones to be able to tell you if there's been a pattern change in what they're purchasing and what they're using that may be significantly deep, different than what they've been doing over the years, so. That would be my recommendation. Okay, nothing, nothing further. Well, thank you. Anybody else, anything? Thank you for your presentation. Again, I say that I'm very lucky to be living in, in the state of California. We have some very talented people that work for this state. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public comment on this issue? I kind of thought we might. Please come up front to the front. I'll make sure that your mic is on and uh, you're not required to give us your name, but we would appreciate it if you would. Thank you, good morning. I'm Susan Tibbon and I appreciate this opportunity to address the committee and uh, Chief Ajax and her staff. Um, one of the committee members, uh, Ms. Yu, made a comment um, 
about the unregulated market. We know that for at least 40 to 50 years, we've never seen what's called an LD50 associated with cannabis. Uh, that means 50% of the test subjects who were animals uh, died. Uh, we've never seen that. We also know that there are various uh, pesticides, things like Eagle 20, which no responsible farmer would use, but is being used. Uh, certainly was used in many of the illegal grows that we've tried to stop. We know that when Eagle 20, as well as other uh, components of various banned pesticides, are heated, uh, they turn to a cyanide gas. And so what I'm getting at here is, and I, I don't know what the fix is, um, is that unless we can do something about the um, barriers to entry, unless we can do something about some of the fees, which, which are just too high, uh, too expensive for, for many people to enter the legal market, we're going to see this situation continue. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. So let me just, uh, we have two minutes per speaker. It's a minute and 30 seconds. Oh, I'll take I'm care sorry. of this. So minute, go ahead. <laughs> it's a minute and 30 seconds per speaker right up here on your table. It'll notify you when you're yellow. That means you have 30 seconds and then it'll go to red. So go ahead. I want to echo what um, Susan said about the comments from uh, Beverly Yu that the different um, jurisdictions throughout the state that have banned access to these to the legal market forces the illegitimate the, the the illegal market they have to go there just to get the medicines that they need i thought it was kind of surprising in response to um keith's question that so far the the department of public health at least the, what i heard i maybe i misheard it that they're not testing the products under heat that they're just testing them cold the, the contents of the vape cartridges and as was stated, when heated, the, this Eagle 20, I forget the, the, the actual name of, of the chemical, Eagle 20 is a brand name, um, gets into the genetics of the plant. And if you have a seed and you can grow it organically, it still would show up. But when it's heated, it turns into cyanide. Apparently, it's safe levels if applied properly for apples and for pears and grapes. But for uh, but when it's heated, it turns into cyanide, and I'm surprised that the, that this, the testing uh, hasn't been done when it's being ignited and when it's being heated. Um, but again, I want to commend Beverly for, for remarking about the, the illicit market and, and that this is where most of them are coming from, and we need to have more uh, lo uh, local jurisdictions approve the legal market. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. If there are any other public comments, feel, uh, feel free to come and fill these seats up so we can know. Uh, yes, my name is Wade Lafter, and I want to point out that uh, THC and CBD have been consumed uh, through the lungs for years without this issue cropping up. Vape pens have been used for years without this issue cropping up. And um, I really... I personally have experienced in my own life the healing benefits of cannabis as medicine. I would really beg you to not do another prohibition of some sort or another that tries to put the blame on the cannabis plant. It's not the cannabis plant that is the problem here, nor is it oils made from the cannabis plant. It is other oils or compounds that get mixed in and or contaminants that are in the vape cartridges themselves. Thank you. Seeing no other folks coming to the mic, thank you for your comment. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, but um, we're going to take a couple items out of order because there are some people that need to leave early and we want to make sure we have an opportunity to have them address the committee and have you have an opportunity to hear from them. So uh, we do need to, at the end of the year, put together a report on uh, the... Um, basically the outcomes and the progress that this committee has made. Um, we had two individuals that worked on our report last year, and I think we're very happy with the work that they did on behalf of the committee, and we're asking that they do that again. Um, 
so with that, I'd like to take up the action of doing the annual report. I know that Ms. Yu and, and Ms. Nevidal were critical in putting that together last year. So is this the moment you're hoping we'll volunteer? Is that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll jump in and I'll, yeah. <laughs> Under the no good deed ever goes unpunished. Um, after the brilliant job that the two of you did last year, I reached out um, to see if you guys would be willing to do it again this year. Um, you both indicated that you would, um, which everyone greatly appreciates. And so we would like to reconstitute that two-person subcommittee, so you can actually talk to each other outside the meeting um, and to put together the report. Um, this accept. is Kristen Evanall, and I accept that. Um, Beverly, you happy to step up to play and do it. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you very much for your commitment to the committee and the work that you do. So, thank you. Do we want to talk about what's going to be in that report? I'm sorry, the next item on that. So I'll entertain some discussion points from the group that items that you think we should highlight for this year. So they have some guide road, road maps and guidance. This is Catherine Jacobson. Um, we had a lively discussion yesterday in the public health and youth subcommittee meeting and what came up was that a lot of the concerns that are, were raised are actually already in the regulations, but um, there's a lack of enforcement of those regulations. So I would, I would, I would like to see that included in the report so that we don't focus on continuing to amend the regulations. We really focus on providing the message that current regulations just need to be enforced better bef before we go on to change regulations. Ms. Jacobson, just a clarification here, Beverly Yu. Was that a recommendation that was taken from the subcommittee and will be presented on today? Yes, we will make those recommendations to the full committee today. Just from a, sorry, uh, Ben was speaking. Just from a timing perspective, are we expecting to have another meeting as a committee before the end of the year? Yes, the plan is to have a December meeting, probably the second week of December. Um, I know that because of the difficulty getting this meeting scheduled, there was a request to start looking at it, uh, the next space as soon as possible. So they've been working on that. Hopefully we'll have a notification soon. Great, thank you. I guess maybe Catherine Jacobson, just a clarification for, for you. Um, the recommendations that we're gonna make to the full committee today do include some language around enforcing current regulations, but um, and, and probably because of Bagley Keen, I have to bring this up now. I think at our next committee meeting, we should talk a little bit more about enforcement and and as a committee, how to how to understand what's being done, what's not being done, and and just bring that to the attention of the the BCC. So. I'll note just so people have some um, stuff to queue on. We had at our last committee meeting, we had presentations on testing laboratories, um, and that was well attended with some recommendations. And we also had an equity diversity um, subcommittee that came back with some recommendations. So those may be some things to highlight again this year. Uh, I do know that we had a request for, for a uh, enforcement subcommittee and I said that I would be scheduling another one of those. Uh, the problem was is that so many people that uh, were on the two committees that we had here this week were also asking to be on another and to be conscientious of committee members' interests on being on other committees. I didn't want to overlap and make it where you couldn't participate in the other committees. So it would be my goal to have at the next uh, meeting in December a subcommittee on enforcement. Um, Kristen Nevidal, just a couple process questions. Um, so we have meeting minutes um, essentially from today and then from the subcommittees yesterday, and those minutes will not be approved um, arguably until the December meeting. So will we be able to have access to those minutes in preparation for the report? And then um, second point, being, I am assuming we'll be expected to bring a draft of the report for approval in December. Sure, you can, you can certainly 
look at the minutes that have been prepared for the various meetings. Um, I th there's also the webcasts too, um, not for the subcommittees, but for the full committees. So that's always an option. Um, the other thing is, yes, I think you do need to, the meeting in December is your last one for this year. And um, it said, and the statute does say commencing January 2019, you'd publish a report, which you did already. Um, for last year, so you're on the same time schedule. Um, so really, the draft would need to come and be finalized with any input from the entire committee at that December meeting, like we did last year. So Catherine I, Jacobson again. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, so just um, to clarify, um, we'll be able to just request the meeting minutes from yesterday and today and get those ahead of time, correct? Some, sometime in the next couple of weeks. You probably won't have minutes in the next couple of weeks, but the webcasts tend to go up fairly quickly. Is that correct, Caesar? Well, this, I'm, I'm a little concerned about capturing the subcommittee. I mean, I was in the cultivation subcommittee, but I was not in the public health subcommittee, so I'm, you know, not able to um, understand what actions were you I wasn't either, but I do want to echo your comment, too. Okay. I, I feel like the substance of what's discussed and to capture that sense and really put it in the report is really discussed in the subcommittee. And we'll make sure we get that in front. Right. Well, there, there are items on the agenda today for each sub subcommittee to report back to the full committee like they did last year. So you will have that information, the report back in, as today as to what their recommendations were. And then the full committee has the opportunity to reject or approve or modify those recommendations today. Catherine Jacobson, also just a process question. We seem to struggle a lot with the rules of the bagley Keene Act because it prevents us from even organizing. Um, so is that an absolute requirement for this committee or, or, or is, is there any, any way for us to revisit that? And that's my first question. Can you clarify? I'm kind of <laughs> lost in the middle there. Sorry. Well, the Bagley Keene Act mm -hmm. dictates the rules of this, how the committee can, can do its business. Um, is that, in fact, law that we must follow? Yeah, it's state law and statute, and it applies to every to all state departments for their boards and bureaus. There's also a very similar act called the Brown Act that applies to local jurisdictions. So that's a statutory mandate. Okay, it might be worth mentioning. I mean, I'm sure this must come up with every committee, every committee then, because we really struggle to, to, to do the work that we need to do under the strict rules of the Bagley Keene Act. And I wonder if we can um, just bring that up. And I wonder if, with other, if this applies to every committee meeting <laughs> at, of the state, how do other committees navigate it to just be more effective and efficient? You know, the goal is not to lose transparency, the goal is just to, for us to be able to be effective and efficient and helpful at, at doing our job. Well, I think in terms of reports like this, annual reports, it's very similar to what you're doing. Often they have a subcommittee of like two people that work on the draft and, and then it comes out. We're of course, you know, because it includes your recommendations for the full year, it tends to wait till the end of the year here. And this year, in order for the Bureau to get, turn it around um, and produce it, we'll have to have the final report on that date as soon as the committee's done you know, um, approving that report. Um, otherwise, we'll struggle to get it out. So the draft hopefully will, like last year, be very close to what it's supposed to be. And it'll be, and, and you guys can finalize the, any language concerns that day. I mean, we could, Tamara, we could, in theory, um, have more subcommittees of two, right? Like we could establish a subcommittee of two that would be able to talk to each other outside the meeting and come to the next meeting with recommendations or, so no. you can you can create subcommittees um, of two, and, and they're not required to be notice meetings under Bagley Keene. Um, however, you can't chunk it up into subcommittees to avoid Bagley Keene. That's true. <laughs> and has, if that makes any sense. And, and to the point, I'm not a huge fan of Bagley Keene myself because it does make it harder. But it, but when you look at the big picture and why it is. It's, 
transparency and access to the public. They don't want us doing public work without it. And so, you know, for the bad that it may be for us getting our work done and the challenges it creates, it's very important for the people to have trust in this committee that we're not out doing stuff. So, can we just create larger subcommittees and just notice the meetings? What's that? Can we just notice the meetings? I mean, if we if we can play, if we need more subcommittees with with more members so people can participate, can we simply hold those meetings and then notice them ten days in advance? And there's even provisions in the new Bagley King where you can have some members attend by phone, for example, for some for some of these other subcommittees that are not the main committee here. I'm just wondering if there are more procedures we could use that. Or less formal. So, the, so the simple answer, but I'll let Tamara respond the more accurate way, is yes, we could always have a meeting that's noticed that gives access to the public. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's correct. Um, there's a couple of things you have to consider with that. Um, one is time and logistics. Um, it takes a lot to get everybody in the same place. It's not easy logistically. We have to find space. There's, you know, there's every time we do one, there is quite a bit of cost. From the teleconference perspective, though, just so you know, there are there have been meetings where people have used what they call multiple meeting sites, and they link them by teleconference. The all of those sites, whatever they are, must be accessible to the public. Mm -hmm. um, and the other risk you have when you do that is that if one meeting site, if the person, the member's not there, or the technology goes down, the entire meeting must stop. Um, and, and that does happen. We've had that happen many times in my time at DCA um, Legal with other boards and bureaus. Um, and so things kind of come to a, to a grinding halt. Um, so that's something to be considered. But legally, you could do it. Operationally, it, it's a little more challenging. Um, you do the reason you have it on your agenda today is to have that conversation so, about the report and what people want to see in it, so that your authors have good direction to bring that draft back at the next meeting. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess by thought, and I, I do serve on several other advisory committees like this, which are smaller than this one, and. You know, you can follow these rules. It said if we had like a three or four person subcommittee that wanted to do the report, it would not, I presume it would be as heavy a lift as getting this whole group together, although I realize there are formalities that have to be followed, et cetera. But typically for others, for smaller advisory committees, it just seems like it's not, doesn't carry the weight and formality of, and all the notice required for this larger group. And it's something we might want to think about. But, but, but I don't know what else the department, you know, there may be, there may be costs the department has. There is, and also to just keep in mind that when you talk about the notice requirements and all that, all of those are the same. None of that changes. So, Just to let you know, I've been asking about having teleconferences and stuff like that. And there is a huge challenge. And I was on one of those committees where a board member left and went somewhere else because something came up and they weren't there to open the meeting space, but a, a public member did show up. She's no longer a board member. Yeah, no, but we um, do it. We, we, we use those, you know, the you know, telecons. It's, you know, it's pretty <laughs> other committees. dramatic. Yeah. So, so it's something to think about. It is something, yeah. As Tim Cernak, another difficulty is that uh, we lost the quorum, and we also did not, and for the subcommittee, and we also did not have uh, it on the agenda to talk about the agenda for the next meeting, hoping there would be a next meeting. And now we would have to call a meeting in order to establish an agenda for a meeting after that. It. The agenda part is really very difficult, and to, to the extent that the BCC can give us guidance and help in how to be setting the agendas, that would be very useful. In terms of the report, I want to point out that last year there was a, a section which were global issues that had not been uh, discussed or, or, or considered yet by the entire committee, and if there could be at least a review of whether or not any, any of those have uh, made any advancement, that would be useful. Thank you. So I can't tell you how the BCC looks at the subcommittees, but I'll tell you how I look at them. Because uh, there's more stuff to do than any of us in this room have time to do. And uh, having subcommittees just to talk about things and not coming with some concrete recommendations seems to be a great waste of time, in my opinion. And so what I would like anybody who's on a committee and chairing a committee to think really deeply about what the goals and outcomes would be, what you'd like to have come up, and be prepared to form your synopsis of the meeting's <laughs> agenda into a, a very quantifiable or very appropriate recommendation that we can consider and then make 
that recommendation part of the full board's recommendation. That's what I'd like. Um, because there's a lot of knowledge and we could talk about a lot of things, but if we don't have something to move, then it isn't a good use of your time either. So, um, How many people can be on the report writing subcommittee? Well, everybody in here could be, but we'd have to notice it once it got over two people because then it would be a violation of Bagley Keen to have a meeting. So that's why we've chosen to um, as the way to go because it allows for more flexibility, nimbality, nimble, to make us more nimble. Um, there is some things that can be done, I believe, that if there's a board member who wants to communicate to a staff person something that they would like, but um, that's not appropriate really either. Yeah, I think you, you have to, you can't use staff as a conduit for a serial meeting. So right, if you okay. guys could talk about it, then you can't. Okay. But the notice requirement is, I mean, the agenda has to be posted 10 days in advance, right? I mean, what else? I mean, is it really that? It has to be posted um, a minimum of 10 days in advance. Um, we have to post it on the website and send it out to interested parties. Okay. So that doesn't seem insurmountable, I guess, is my, yeah. Just a, there's a question about what happened. So the, the more difficult part, though, is securing space and mm -hmm. then the logistics and staff time, um, and, and that's, that gets um, complicated, especially as we get, um, sh you know, sh we don't, there's not a lot of time between now and the December meeting, um, and so finding space can be, very difficult um, for meetings, and that's been quite a challenge. Tim Cermak, I think that when there are only two, there can be multiple iterations that pass between those two, and a great deal of work could be done. But when there's three, no such iterations in between the meetings could occur, and that would make the writing of the report exceedingly hard. Any other thoughts or questions? Do our two report writers feel like they have a pretty good idea how they might tackle the challenges that we've put before them? Okay, all right. Well, I think we have a pretty good idea on that. We can move to the next, or is, or is this something that requires public comment? It does require public comment. Oh, okay. Comment. How about anybody want to talk about our, our challenges <laughs> with putting together a report for next year or what you think should be noted in the report? That seemed to have See? Yeah, all right. Well, just like us, we're challenged with that. All right, we'll move on to the next item. 1140. So do you, I think we could go to the next one. We're gonna take also the item number six next instead of item number five. And that'll be the discussions of possible actions to reject, approve, or modify subcommittee on cultivation's recommendations. Kristen Nevidal was our subcommittee chair. And we have four items that were tackled or may have been tackled. I don't know. I wasn't at the subcommittee meeting. Uh, um, yes, thank you. Kristen Nevidal, um, subcommittee chair for cultivation. Um, we did um, discuss all items that appeared on the agenda. Um, we started with Appalachian of Origin and County of Origin programs, which we bundled into one discussion topic um, for um, ease, basically. Um, and within that, we discussed kind of the changes that had been made to these programs via SB 185. Um, we also took some time to discuss, um, let me see, I have some notes, my apologies. Um, we took some time, some time to discuss the difference between the programs, County of Origin program largely being a geographical indication program, which provides branding opportunity based on political boundaries, right, i.e. the county boundary itself, um, and offers a very inclusive opportunity for participation. This program is open to all cultivators, regardless of type of license the cultivator may have, and also includes manufactured and non-manufactured products. Um, and to qualify, the cannabis would have to be produced within, 100% of the cannabis would have to be produced within the county um, that is noted on the label. The Appalachian of Origin program is um, a bit of a different framework. Appalachian programs um, often include um, references and requirements around standards, practices, and in this case, um, cultivars. Um, and Appalachian programs traditionally are terroir-based. Um, and by that, I mean that um, Appalachian programs in nature are exclusive 
in that farmers must, um, well, let me say, for, well, let me back up a minute. Um, Appalachian programs tend to be exclusive simply because the product and the distinctive qualities of the product that is wearing the Appalachian seal are exclusively due to the natural environment in which the product was produced, i.e. Mother Nature, right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. So um, in that description, um, there are definitely some challenges um, potentially that are posed. Um, we did get some update or receive some update from Cal Cannabis, which was greatly appreciated on both of the programs. And within that, um, we can expect an Appalachian regulatory packet to um, head to OAL sometime in December. So we'll be seeing draft regulations um, early in 2020, if not slightly sooner. Um, and from um, members of the public, we heard um, concerns about the County of Origin program potentially not being inclusive enough. Um, cultivators from cities such as Oakland potentially not relating to, um, say, having to label or the opportunity to label their product as an Alameda-grown product, right? That's the county in which Oakland, um, the city of Oakland, exists. Um, also, um, there was concern expressed about preservation of heritage cultivators, um, immediate and long-term value um, of the Appalachian program, and how to maintain long-term value of the Appalachian program as we move away from, say, just state-to-state -state programs for cannabis and into national and international commerce related to cannabis. And throughout that conversation, um, Appalachian programs um, have been developed um, for hundreds of years at this point. And um, largely with the idea of helping support um, small businesses and um, the uh, kind of cultural and um, genetic kind of heritage that is associated with said products. Um, so we did make a recommendation around both of these and it was folded into one recommendation. Um, I can try to repeat it from memory, or would you like to read it? That would be fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> so the first recommendation is that the committee recommend that county of origin program be extended to include a city of origin opportunity and Appalachians program, including minimum standards for in-ground culti cultivation, open air, and without supplemental light. Also, that the California Department of Food and Agriculture have a consumer platform on its website to educate consumers on county of origin, city of origin, and Appalachian standards, including specifics on each approved Appalachian. Thank you for that. And um, just, I did forget to mention the consumer education conversation that came up and um, the concerns expressed around how to hold value in both programs is really going to be um, dependent upon the consumer understanding the differences of these programs, county of origin versus an Appalachian program. And then within Appalachian programs, it's likely that the individual Appalachians will have unique standards, practices, and potentially cultivar controls that are specific to the Appalachian that is established. So making sure that there's an educational program to relate that information back to the consumer. Um, so process, I'm sorry, I'm a little rusty um, on, I don't remember how we did this last time. Um, we read the recommendation, then do I um, request conversation from the subcommittee and then go to? I think I, think I request the conversation if you're ready to do it Great. one at a time. Or do you want me to put them all together? I'm happy well, to put them all together if that's, we can do that as my well. My only concern is that was pretty long. Mm -hmm. And if they're all long, then people may lose the, um, you know, which one. Well, how about I give you a little um, taste of what we have going on here. All together, we made three recommendations. Okay. So um, we bundled these two. Um, we have a recommendation around the organics program and then a second, a third recommendation around overlapping and shared premise. So we could knock this one out and then it might be easiest for the subcommittee to, or for the committee to discuss this and then move on. Yep, that'd probably be good. All right. So do we have any conversations about the recommendation that was made by the subcommittee on the issues of Appalachian and of origin and county origin? 
Member Nikita, can you just clarify that what you said about um, including cities within the county of origin program? Can you just explain that just distinction? Sure. Sure. So um, currently the county of origin program only allows for the labeling of the county name. Um, and over the course of this last legislative session, there's been some concern expressed by cultivators, um, say, from Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, that it may be hard for them to label their products as a Los Angeles product when the entirety of the unincorporated area of the county has a ban. Right? So... Um, how to, the desire with creating a city of origin opportunity is to ensure that there's an inclusive opportunity for um, geographical indication branding, right, um, in that program. I'm, I'm hoping that helps. And so this would just allow them to say LA city grown? Correct. Maybe not LA, but Los Angeles because it's the full name, um, we aren't clear how acronyms would work in that case. Tim Cermak here. Is, is this designed in some way to make it so that if someone has an indoor grow, grow in Humboldt County that's hydroponic and done under grow lights, that they would not be able to use the appellation of people that are growing it out in the Humboldt soil with the sun and... Um, that is correct. So um, to clarify a little bit further, the county of origin program would allow for the hydroponic and indoor cultivated or, you know, product to actually wear the Humboldt County name as a branding opportunity. But um, arguably, it is a challenge to show a uh, uh, exclusive causal link to the distinctiveness of the product, right, as far as it being exclusively caused by the natural environment if you are um, um, manipulating that environment through temporal settings or light settings. So um, this is the reason for um, requesting the baseline standards for the Appalachian program is to um, create alignment with um, international Appalachian programs so that what rolls out is akin to um, traditional Appalachian programs. Any other questions or comments? I had a question. Um, if we, Please state your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Avis Bobulian. If we were to expand out the Appalachians to include cities as well as counties, does that in general discount the value of the Appalachian where basically it goes city by city and it's all up and down the state? So point of clarification is that we are not suggesting that cities or counties be utilized in the Appalachian program, but that the cities could be added to the county of origin program, which is a geographical indicator program based on political boundaries. So we could think of it somewhat as um, a made in this area, right? So made in the city of Los Angeles, made in the city of Oakland, made in Alameda or made in Trinity County. Um, so I don't think that it, impacts the um, validity or the integrity of the Appalachian program because it really is that comment or recommendation is focused on the geographical indicator program, the county of origin component. Mr. Stevenson? Yes, thank you. Uh, Keith Stevenson. Yesterday, uh, committee subcommittee member Bill Dombrowski made a very significant statement and what he communicated was that there is a need for a state state appellation for California grown cannabis and uh, if he could take a moment to communicate what he stated yesterday to the greater body I, I, I think it'd be of great importance to hear. I don't know what he's been drinking today. Uh, I was actually following off of Ben's comments yesterday in that we need to keep in mind that the ultimate goal of all of this someday, when it's federally legalized, we're going to want to have a Made in California program. Uh, and that was the gist of what I was talking about. So whatever we're doing on, on this level should just keep that in the back of our minds. Please. Yeah, just to jump in on that, I think to Avis's point, right, um, and it drives to what Part of the reason in that proposal or this proposal we have uh, this for the recommendation is this education piece because I do think it can be confusing, right? You have a, you know, a, 
Appalachian of origin, and then you have a county, and now we're talking about a city. Um, so we're balancing that need to be kind of inclusive of everyone's ability to, you know, essentially market and, and represent kind of their, their city or county of choice. But when we do think about the long term, right, we want to be cognizant that for it, that appellation of origin to really have value, you want to be as in lockstep with how other appellation of origins for other industries operate. So, the, and frankly, I think we make this recommendation while also waiting to see what the formal, you know, regulations come out to be in early 2020, maybe end of 2019. Uh, so we don't quite know yet, right? So, but this is our kind of best approach as to how do we kind of meet all needs. We're not saying that this is, you know, we're, we're expecting this to be forever, but this will be a transition, I think, that starts us in the right path. And, and if I may add to that, I think that, um, you know, both of these programs are complicated. Geographical indicators and the differences between a geographical indication program and, say, an Appalachian of origin program, um, they are fairly complex programs. Geographical indicator programs do not necessarily have a set of standards by which those products are produced by, nor do they have um, a, a a reference to or an expectation to show that there is an exclusive or distinctive quality to the product that is directly related to the political area in which they are produced, right? So um, really it is a, a, the easiest way for me to explain a geographical indicator program such as county of origin and this proposal to add a city of origin opportunity is that it is a made-in that area, right? Like made in the USA, made in California, made, right? And an Appalachian program has these additional layers of standards, practices, and cultivar controls that are designed to help ensure that the distinctive qualities of the Appalachian product are exclusively due to the natural environment in which that product was produced. So, um, it's a little complex, but um, also the recommendations that we've made around Appalachian, um, in my mind, would help to provide a defendable opportunity for Appalachian products to show that they are actually reflective of the natural environment in which they are produced. So um, I'll leave that there. Tim Cermak here. Will, will a, a, a grower need to apply for the right to use an appellation, or will they just be allowed to use it? Well, um, I'm going to look into my crystal ball and say yes. Right? We don't have the regulations. They have not been put forth yet, but um, we did, California Department of Food and Agriculture's um, Cal Cannabis Division did host a series of seven um, Appalachian Working Group meetings. Um, while these meetings focused primarily on the development of the Appalachian program, um, county of origin was discussed and guidelines have been issued around county of origin. You can find them on the Cal Cannabis website in the FAQ section. Um, and traditionally, there is a petition process where a group of farmers um, from, say, a given geographical region will come together with um, agreed upon or consensus standards, practices, and in this case, cultivar um, control and petition CDFA, Cal Cannabis, to acknowledge their appellation. So. Well, do we have a motion and a second, and then we could put it up to public comment. I'll make the motion that the full committee approve the subcommittee's recommendation as read. Bill Dombrowski, I'll second. Sorry, and that was David <coughs> Woolsey making the motion. Okay, let's uh, see if we have anybody in the audience that would like to give us some feedback. And just to remind the public that this is public comment on the motion, uh, the subcommittee on cultivation's recommendation number one. There will be a chance for public to comment on items not on the agenda later. Hi, Paul Hansbury. Um, I'd like to state, as I stated um, at the uh, subcommittee as well, that uh, with the county of origin as well as the Appalachian program, that there should be some incentives for the small farmer because anyone who's growing with a large 
um, <clears throat> indoor scene might be able to just hitchhike on the, the reputation, for instance, in the Emerald Triangle. They've got an international reputation for the quality of their cannabis. And for someone to come into the Emerald Triangle with a, a huge grow, indoor grow, and just so they could say that they were from the county of Mendocino, they'd just be hitchhiking on the work that all these small farmers have been doing for generations. Uh, and I think that the, the, we might want to introduce something that's maybe a little foreign to the regulatory process and introduce incentives instead of just dictating uh, what it should be. And so incentives for the small farmer to become a part of this program. Thank you. Speaker three. It's you. My name is Steve Oku, and uh, I just want to inform you, San Mateo County basically says we cannot grow cannabis and have any groundwater go in. So basically we can't have roots contact the soil because then water goes into the groundwater table. So I would like to be able to label my product with an Appalachia. And it seems to me with as strict as this is about saying it has to be grown in ground, we would not be able to do that. And also, you know, my family's been growing flowers and other plants for 117 years now. And for 80 years, we grow in soil, but when we grow in soil, we amend the soil. You know, we'll put redwood bark, we'll put oyster shell lime on there, we'll till the soil. And so it's not the native soil. I don't understand the problem when you take soil and you put it in a pot. Why can't that be okay? All the rest of the stuff in the environment that makes an Appalachian an Appalachian is still there. The plants grow healthier. You don't have disease when you've grown the soil. You have more disease, which requires more pesticide usage, more weaker plants, insects like weak plants. It just makes sense to give the plants the best opportunity to grow. And if that's growing in a container in a very sterilized soil with the proper air water ratio, why discourage that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker one. Uh, yes, Wade Laughter, Nevada County. <clears throat> uh, I would like to ask the committee to uh, accept the recommendations of the subcommittee, uh, primarily because this is one of the combination of uh, the inclusive nature of the geographic indicator and the exclusive nature of the Appalachians program are one of the few things that the state could do to help the small heritage farmers actually survive in this new regulated marketplace. One day, cannabis will be acknowledged around the world as a consumer product, that, and California's reputation for the quality of our work in this area will be acknowledged, if you will, around the world. Uh, so anything that we can do and anything that you can do that you could recommend that the state regulators and or legislators do to help these small farmers will help to preserve and protect the legal market and help to shut down the free market. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 3. Hello, I'm John Brower from Trinity County and I agree with the subcommittee's recommendations and a current uh, approval of it. I think uh, making the county or and perhaps city of origin very inclusive and drawing the line there between that and the Appalachians of origin, which would be quite exclusive and, and very specialized in nature, like the su very successful wine growing regions of Europe uh, have proven for centuries now. Um, it uh, you know, it's early days, um, but that seems like the logical place to draw the line right now and encourage localities to uh, develop their own Appalachian of origin standards. So once again, I encourage approval of these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, John. Seeing no more further comments, back to you. Very good. So unless there's any other comments by the committee, uh, I'll call the roll. No, that's right. I just was going to move the previous question. Same thing you just said. Very good. So this, this motion is that the committee recommend that county of origin program be extended to include a city of origin opportunity and Appalachians program 
to include minimum standards for in-ground cultivation, open air, and without supplemental light. Also that the California Department of Food and Agriculture have a consumer platform on its website to educate consumers on county of origin, city of origin, and appellation standards, including specifics on each approved appellation. Babulian? Aye. Sir Mack? Aye. Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. So I have a question. We are at noon. If anybody is really desirous of taking a break, we can take a break and then come back to the other recommendations or we can go through these and take our break before the next committee. And if we are going to do that, we could take a small bio break, allow people to go um, either make a call or Pardon me, Kristen Evadal. Um, I, I do not believe the next two recommendations are not, are really as long as the first, um, but I'm I'm open to whatever the committee feels. Let's let's do it then, like a five minute break. Let's just go through. We have some requests for some bio breaks. They don't want to miss this interesting topic. And so let's take five minutes. And I'm going to hold you to five. I know the restrooms are a little bit, but. Um, <laughs> Sorry, that was a little longer. Something came up, as usual. So we're good. Mr. Sweeney, there we go. Do we have a quorum? Can we check? I know we're missing Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Dombrowski. We're good. Okay, let's uh, let's get our second recommendation. Okay, great. Um, so the second item that we discussed in the cultivation subcommittee, and again, this is Kristen Nevedal speaking, um, was in relationship to the Cal Organics Program or the Comparable Organic Program for Cannabis, um, which will be called OCAL. Um, and so um, in this program, we did also, or in this discussion, we also received a brief update on the program details or the development um, through or from Cal Cannabis. Um, and so, um, similarly to the Appalachian Working Group, um, Cal Cannabis has convened a working group um, to discuss um, what I would like to say is a cannabinizing California's organics program, so um, a molding that into a cannabis appropriate program. Um, we do expect to see um, a regulatory packet, or the regulatory packet is slated to head to OAL in January, so we will see that um, the regulations around um, the comparable organics program sometime um, later in that month. Um, <clears throat> um, concern during the discussion, concern was expressed by the public um, and discussion was had over the potential cost of certification. Um, also, are there ways to potentially um, incentivize um, certification? Um, and also, um, discussion was had around whether or not um, cultivators or um, even manufacturers because the program has through SB uh, 67 and AB 97, gosh I hope I got that right, um, but the program was expanded through legislation this year to also include not just non-manufactured products but manufactured products. So um, along with um, Cal Cannabis, California Department of Public Health is also working on um, development of program that helps to ensure that manufactured products have the ability to be certified. Um, and so um, one of the primary points of conversation I think that came up and it's reflected in our recommendation is if these um, businesses or licensees are being certified say as not utilizing pesticides, right, the list of, of um, pesticides are already pretty narrow that can be used. Um, is there the ability to, as a certified entity, 
um, potentially have some reduction in testing. And, and this really is what led us to um, the recommendation from the subcommittee, which I will ask if you would be so kind as to read, please. Committee recommend that a skip lot testing program be established in conjunction with OCAL program that allows companies certified under OCAL program to use. Regulator can decide when a company is eligible for skip testing once certified under OCAL. Um, and so that is the only recommendation that we made in relationship to the um, OCAL program. So. Second. Well, there wasn't a first yet, but we're looking for some conversation first on it. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, just to jump in, uh, Chris, Ben, we're speaking of Kristen mentioned you know, this discussion about skip lot testing, just to be clear, doesn't mean that upon certification you are bypassing testing. It's that the regulators have the authority to determine, say you pass a year's worth of testing or whatever they determine to be appropriate, then at a certain point they might qualify for no testing or randomized testing on a, a rest, less regular basis. Yeah, um, Kristen Neville here. Skip lot testing really is a randomized <coughs> testing program. So um, once you've cleared the ability to move into a skip lot sort of framework for testing, um, the producer, the cultivator, or the manufacturer does not know ahead of time when their number is going to be called for testing. It's fully randomized, which um, is kind of designed to keep everybody on their toes because if we knew, oh, we won't be tested for six months, then there's potentially the, like, you know, I could creep into bad behavior and then be prepared back, <laughs> right, in um, alignment with testing in that six-month window. But this is, the proposal is for a completely randomized type of testing protocol. Uh, Catherine Jacobson, <clears throat> Kristen, is is there an established system already in place for for organic labeling that we can that, that could be used for this just to standardize it? I mean, that must exist already. Um, well, as far as the um, OCAL program is concerned, they are modeling it after national organic program standards, and then um, each state has the ability to take that NOP program and then create additional standards. So um, California, for example, if we take cannabis out of the picture, um, their organic program is based on the national organic program, but California um, and Washington State, I would have to say, are probably the two most rigorous organic programs in the country. They have added multiple layers of requirements to the national organic program. Um, so I know while we're looking at the NOP, there's, you know, this program will have to align also with regulations and limits on what can be utilized for pesticides that already exists in the regulations today for cannabis. So um, I imagine it will be a pretty rigorous program. Tim Cermak here. When you say that uh, the organic part is great, when you say that there would be some skipping of testing, is that only skipping of testing for pesticides, or would we then have products where we don't know what the concentration is of, uh, of the yeah, ingredients? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think that's a really important question. And um, it's my understanding, based on the discussion we had yesterday, that the, um, the recommendation is focused on pesticides specifically. Seeing no other questions, Mr. Sweeney? I'm looking for a recommendation. I'll move it. <laughs> Bill Dombrowski. Do we have a first? Okay, very good. Um, what is the motion? What is the motion you're recommending? So, Dombrowski, what is the recommendation you're recommending? We adopt the re the uh, recommendation. Oh. Recommendation number two hmm? of yeah. the subcommittee yeah. on cultivation. Very good. And I'm seconding it. Yes. <laughs> so now we open up for public comment. Do we have any comment from our public? Remember, we have one and a half minutes. Paul Hansberry, um, I support the recommendation. Um, 
I would also hope that with the OCAL, that they, uh, and when they're following the NOP and the organics program, that they would keep in mind for the, for, especially for the small farmer, that the, the fee structure, I know that with the organics program that it's not by product, it's by uh, container size, that you have to pay a certain fee in order to use the label. If it's a one ounce, a five ounce, a one gallon or a five gallon, it's for each size of the same product. And I would hope that that would not carry over to this organic program, that it would be, uh, for, for especially for manufactured products, that it would be just for uh, the product and not the size in the container. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. One, Speaker. Three. I was Hello, once again, John Brower from Trinity County, and uh, I also encourage approval of this recommendation. Uh, I've been to several of the OCAL uh, workshops, and uh, they're putting together a, a robust program. Uh, it would follow the National Organic Program Standards, uh, which is great. It's got a very recognizable uh, label. It's known internationally for a high-quality, uh, robust uh, program. Um, so I, uh, I encourage approval of this. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 3. Speaker 1. Hi, Susan Tibbon. Um, if we take a look at um, adherence to organic standards on the part of uh, farmers market participants, say in uh, San Francisco County, Alameda, and Mendocino, we're seeing many, if not all, of the very small entities not adhering to organic standards. They're, they're adhering to them, but they cannot meet the fees and all the hoops they have to jump through. So as we go forward, I hope that we're looking at being inclusionary and making it possible for, again, the smaller entities to be part of the program. Because as far as food items go, uh, most small farmers just, they, they cannot bear the costs. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 2. Can you turn on your mic? Oh. There you go. Hi, Monique Ramirez. I'm also from Mendocino County, and I represent a 2,500 square foot license type. Um, and I'm super excited to know that we're even thinking about having an organics program. I think we need to be leading the way in California for how we set the bar for agriculture, especially with cannabis. And um, I really hope that this board will move forward with this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 2. Speaker 1. There we go. Hi, I'm Mitchell Colbert, uh, lobbyist for Firefly Vapor. Uh, though I'm giving this question or giving this uh, comment as an uh, individual, not representing my client, um, I think this is a great idea. We definitely need uh, organic licensing labeling for the cannabis industry. Uh, existing research already shows that California's cannabis actually has lower rates of illegal pesticide exposure compared to our other uh, agricultural products grown here. We're already cleaner than lettuce. We're already cleaner than potatoes. We're already cleaner than grapes, much cleaner than grapes, where microbutanol is actually very commonly used and can contaminate soils and groundwater, which can affect cannabis growers. So um, without bank loans, without uh, farm uh, insurance, without any of the perks that traditional agriculture has, our cannabis farmers are already doing better. So we need to encourage them by actually letting them get licensed and uh, show how organic and compliant they are. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 2. Uh, yes, Wade Laughter, Nevada County. Uh, I think the uh, Cal Organics Program for Cannabis is a very important program. Uh, and primarily because, unlike virtually all other agricultural products, this one is heated and inhaled. Our digestive system can deal with all kinds of toxins and uh, contaminants. Our lungs, not so much. Look at the vaping conversation we were having earlier. Uh, <clears throat> To me, again, if cannabis is going to be a, it is becoming a consumer product that will enjoy wide use, we really need to set the standard as high as possible to protect health and human safety. It's the contaminants that come with the plant, not the plant itself, that is the potential harm. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Two. Seeing no more further comments, we'll send it back to you, Chair. Very good. Can we have you read back and take the roll? I just have a, can I have a sure. So my question is just, Mr. Just Nikita. A, Mr. Nikita, just a clarification that the skip lot testing applies to the requirements to maintain your OCAL certification. It doesn't affect the uh, testing requirements, generally speaking, that you're required to 
to do before you bring a product to market, correct? Okay. So, so with that clarification, can we take the roll? The motion is that the committee recommend that a skip lot testing program be established in conjunction with OCAL program that allows companies certified under OCAL to use. Regulators can decide, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when a company is eligible for skip testing once certified under OCAL. Obulian? Aye. Cermak? Aye. Clifford? Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Leff? Oh, I'm sorry, not Leff. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, Ms. Nevidal, recommendation number three, please. Um, Sorry about that. Um, this is Kristen Nevidal, and recommendation number three um, is in relationship to the, um, the agenda item of, I'm sorry, overlapping and shared premises. So um, we did discuss timelines, but did not um, make a recommendation um, in that discussion. Um, by and far and large, we heard um, substantial concern around timelines, um, largely regarding CEQA, um, and then also um, timelines for modification approval. So as a cultivator needs to modify their license, what is the timeline for that modification to actually go through and um, through the Cal Cannabis process. Um, we received some information back that um, there is a lot of work happening within Cal Cannabis to adjust the portal system, um, allowing for streamlined opportunities of renewing provisionals, transferring tran provisionals into an annual. Um, and so those systems should come up and be online shortly, and then we will receive notice. Um, as far as recommendation number three is concerned, um, this item was really around, as I mentioned earlier, overlapping and shared premise. Um, due to permanent regulations or in the process of developing permanent regulations, we saw some changes within um, Cal Cannabis on how shared premises should be um, reflected in mapping and what premises, what portions of premises um, may be shared. And, for the sake of clarifying in this conversation, um, shared premises are um, uh, when a licensee holds multiple cultivation licenses, the licensee has the ability to share um, compost areas amongst those cultivation licenses, waste areas amongst those cultivation licenses, and agricultural um, and agricultural and pesticide storage areas amongst those licenses. And in sharing any of those three areas as a licensee amongst multiple cultivation licenses that you hold, you must show on your maps that those areas are overlapping. Um, over the course of discussion um, amongst subcommittee members and with the public, um, we heard um, repeated um, concern expressed around the inability to share propagation and processing areas amongst a license for a licensee who holds multiple cultivation licenses. Um, this has posed significant challenges for, um, say, smaller cultivators or existing cultivators who may not always have the ability to cultivate to the full extent of their license size because they may be limited by the local jurisdiction to only cultivate the amount of cultivation they had pre-legalization um, occurring and regulations coming into place. So what we're seeing is someone have an outdoor cultivation license, someone might also have, the same person might also have to have, say, a mixed light cultivation license because they do some full term, they do some light depth, so now they're into two licenses. Those two licenses now 
um, prohibit that cultivator from sharing their propagation area. It prohibits that cultivator from sharing their processing area. So now the cultivator is required to have a nursery license and required to have a processing license, which now triggers a transportation license. So you can roll a wheelbarrow from your nursery to your garden, from your garden to your processing, say. And um, we had a lot of concern about the um, economic impacts and also the environmental impacts associated with requiring more build out and larger footprints um, on the land. So um, with that said, we um, passed a recommendation that, thank you, Kayla. Recommendation is that the committee or committee recommends that a license holding a licensee holding multiple cultivation licenses be allowed to share propagation and processing areas in addition to current shared spaces for storage, compost waste, and pesticides pesticide storage. Do we have any questions or comments by the committee? Um, may I add a clarifying point to that? Um, yes, you may. So. Um, over the course of the conversation, we also realized that in municipalities where people have been permitted to conduct their cultivation activities, um, while these municipalities are approving the processing and the nursery licenses on said parcel for the licensee holding multiple licenses, um, oftentimes the licensee is restricted from being able to actually operate as a nursery, meaning that they are prohibited by the local municipality from selling plants off of that nursery license. They are only allowed to serve themselves in most cases. The same is true for the processing. So we have multiple folks in the state being forced to purchase nursery licenses and processing licenses, yet they cannot service anyone other than the licenses they hold. So they have no ability to conduct sales or generate revenue and associate it with those licenses. They are strictly for internal use only. This is Catherine Jacobson. Wasn't wasn't one of the objectives of the micro the micro license to 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 allow businesses to have multiple components with just one license? And how come that doesn't solve this issue? So. Um, I would say yes, that that was the objective of the micro business license. However, um, under local jurisdiction, we see the zoning issues around the micro business license make that opportunity prohibitive to most rural cultivators or cultivators that are actually on agricultural lands because um, processing in a centralized kind of processing um, setting where you are serving. Um, multiple licensees is requiring um, oftentimes a commercially zoned property in order to actually host that type of activity. And the same is often true for nurseries. They are often zoned out of egg areas because there's this assumption of sales happening and lots of, say, um, transportation or shipping needs um, to and from those facilities. So we often see them zoned off of agricultural lands and onto um, commercial manufacturing or industrial lands. Mr. Bavillion? Uh, this Davis, and also to clarify the micro business, there are a lot of scenarios where the micro business wouldn't address it. For instance, with the micro business, you would have to maintain three of the four activities. And if you're strictly a cultivator with multiple cultivation licenses, the micro wouldn't apply to it. Um, same with manufacturing and retail and all the other categories. There are a lot of scenarios where having the ability to have a common area um, really addresses a lot. It doesn't eat up as many square footages. So if you happen to have two, three uh, cultivation licenses, you don't need to have full build out for each one where each one's a standalone. The, you get to share in your common area spaces. Seeing no other. And I think it's just Good. important to re-clarify that, you know, this is for one licensee, meaning, you know, it's same person, so there's no risk of people finger pointing, say it's on him versus it's on that person, and I didn't know what they were doing, right? This is all self-contained um, is the first point. And the second point is we really did take a cautious approach in that we weren't trying to just open it up to all operations, right? With certain areas that we excluded from uh, currently uh, are excluding from this are, you know, quarantine. Right, uh, Kristen, clarify what, which, other, which other ones we're excluding. Yeah, we, um, we did not include in this motion the harvest storage area um, or the administrative hold area. 
we really focused on processing and um, nursery or, or self-propagation and self-processing is really how I think it's better phrased. So my only question, so what you, you're saying is that this isn't like operator A and operator B sharing the same property. It would be operator A has two different license types that they're operating on the same premise. And then even for operator A, we, you know, the quarantine areas uh, and some of the, the storage areas, we still want to make sure that it's easy for regulators enforcement to come in and clearly identify or eliminate the risk of having things commingled, right? So we're still also trying to be judicious and cautious in that approach. Then I guess my other question is, does that it, does the operator A, having operator A and A on the same premise with more than 20 employees, is there a chance where that might modify that? So from my So I, I, we did have some conversation. We heard some comments from labor yesterday and some concerns expressed even after the subcommittee meeting. Um, and I just want to say for clarification's sake, um, what we're talking about here are farms. And so yeah. when a farm is permitted under a local jurisdiction, it is the entirety of the farm, whether there's outdoor and mixed light, there's processing, there's nursery. It's the farm that is permitted and it's generally run as a farm and it is staffed with one staff and this assumption that there is going to be different staff persons for every single cultivation license held by a licensee is a false premise. This is not, um, it's not a reality that that's how operations are happening and if it was a requirement I think it would be um, very hard to fulfill that requirement A because um, the labor to have all of those different individuals participate, that labor body isn't even really available. So this is not going to impact or change how many employees are working at any given time in association sure. with um, a license. Thank you for that explanation. So any other comments by the, Mr. Cermak, Dr. Cermak? Yes, Tim Cermak. Um, this is way out of my uh, area, but um, the, the main question I have is, uh, is there any possibility this opens uh, loopholes that will, um, will benefit larger uh, corporate interests uh, than the smaller interests? So um, this is Kristen Navidal, and we did discuss this um, to some extent um, yesterday. So um, while we do have some stacking of licenses in California that actually, you know, um, add up to substantial amounts of cultivation area, um, those folks are in the same boat about have, as far as having to have a nursery license and or a processing license to manage all of their um, material internally. Now, as far as loopholes are concerned, I suppose that they could under this potentially evade the processing and or nursery license if they are choosing to only serve their own cultivation licenses. Um, and in 2023, when we see the, potentially the ability of type five licenses, I find it really hard to believe that these cultivators who are stacking licenses would continue to stack licenses and not just move into a type five license, which then would allow them the ability to provide all of their own propagated material under that one license and all of their own um, processing under that one license. So um, while temporarily that could be you know, an opportunity for them as well, I think the benefits to the um, small businesses outweigh the potential risks um, associated with offering the same um, opportunity to large businesses, understanding that in 2025 they're likely going to become one license and then have the same opportunity at that point. Uh, this is, uh, William, to also add to that, whatever benefit the small guy is going to get, the big guy is also going to get. The primary thing about this uh, motion would be it's a big-time big, uh, big time cost saving uh, motion, and it also streamlines operations. Now, understanding that it does benefit the big guy just as much as it benefits the small guy, it does benefit the small guy more than the big guy because the big guy does have the money to spend, um, even if this wasn't there. So um, I don't think it should be one or the other. Uh, as long as it does benefit the small guy and gives them that opportunity, the big guy always has the options to do whatever they need to do to get it through. 
Yeah, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. And um, what appears to be the case, too, is that in most areas where we have um, non-cannabis um, agricultural activities happening, um, those facilities, those properties are more likely to be zoned appropriately for commercial processing and or commercial nursery activities. So the opportunity is also um, greater in many cases for those businesses operating um, kind of at a larger scale because they're on lands that tend to be um, zoned for said activities in a much more suitable manner. Very good. I seem to recall from the subcommittee discussion yesterday, there was a question open about whether this raised a statutory issue or not. I don't remember if we resolved that or not, but I'm kind of curious, did anyone follow up on that and did we get a definite answer? I'd, I'm going to vote for it, but I just would like to know that. Mr. Clifford, by the way, for the... Oh, sorry, I asked Mr. Clifford. So, Kristen Abadal, again, um, I, I, we did discuss this a bit yesterday, and I think um, the, the question that... I asked was um, in regards to how the department came to the decision that um, areas such as compost, waste, and um, agricultural and, and pesticide storage could be shared, but yet other excuse me, but that other areas potentially couldn't be. And I know that the department had um, extensive internal deliberation to get to the place of sharing um, the waste and the compost and the agricultural and chemical storage areas. So um, this motion really urges them to review um, that conversation and see if they can't find a way to move these pieces forward as well. No other questions? Can we open it up? Oh, can I get a motion and a second, please? Uh, I move the motion. I'll second. Will William? The motion's to move item number three from the Cultivation Subcommittee. So we open up for public comment. Is there any comment from the public on this particular issue? Speaker one, whenever you're ready. Um, I just want to say that there's something else to be keeping in mind, and that's the track and trace element, that that is keeping separate all of the items and the product. And so there's some assurance there. And I don't understand why we have to be caught up in it has to be in this, it has to be separated by these structures and stuff like that if track and trace is keeping um, the inventory database accounted for. Um, and also, I'm glad that you're speaking about the um, the cost. Um, when we say a processing room, I mean, that's a build out, that's a building that requires a building permit. You have to go through all of the hoops um, to get that approved by your county. And it takes a lot of time, especially in rural areas with limited construction people to even come up to your property. And it's not environmentally sound. So if we can consolidate and be able to allow people to trim their cannabis in the same place, that's what processing is. It's literally like a pair of scissors and a tray and you're just taking the leaf matter off, so um, in the most basic sense. So if we can um, consolidate that in any way and not make a hardship for small farms, I think it'll be a win. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 3? Uh, John Brown from Trinity County, and I agree with the previous speaker. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, we're having this issue is because the existing uh, definition of an outdoor license type and mixed one license types, they really failed to capture the reality on the ground with, uh, with the industry uh, where most folks in the Emerald Triangle run uh, long season big girls uh, uh, that require an outdoor license and at least some light deprivation but without actually adding additional artificial light. So one way to remedy this would be to uh, iron out the problems with those license types and allow for uh, either mixed light tier one to do some outdoor also under that same license type or to allow light deprivation under the existing outdoor license type. Uh, or we could create an additional license type that 
better captures the reality on the ground in the Emerald Triangle. But in lieu of that, this is a great fix. It, it's a it's a big streamlining feature, and it's it's a, a very practicable and, and feasible way of, of addressing this. So I encourage uh, approval of this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. Speaker One. Uh, Wade Lafter, Nevada County. Uh, I want to also encourage uh, acceptance of this recommendation. Anything that we can do to make it easier for legal farmers to operate in the system we have set up is going to help to shut down the illegal free market that exists in California and across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker One. Speaker Three. Hi, uh, Jazzy Graywell with UFCW Western States Council. Um, just wanted to uh, state that if the committee does choose to expand the parameters of what's permissible, um, a uh, portion of a premise to share or overlap, then we do need to consider and ensure that licensees aren't able to distribute their employees amongst the licensees, because some jurisdictions do have thresholds that are lower than 20. Uh, so just want to make sure that the committee keeps that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Three. Any other public comment? Seeing no public comment, we'll send it back to the chair. So seeing no other comments, I'll call the roll. The motion is that the committee recommend a licensee holding multiple cultivation licenses be allowed to share propagation and processing areas in addition to current shared spaces for storage, compost waste, and pesticide storage. Babouillon. Aye. Sir Mack? Aye. Aye. Dombrowski? Aye. Farrow? Aye. Harada? Aye. Jacobson? Aye. Lynch? Aye. Nevdal? Aye. Nikita? Aye. Ron? Aye. Stevenson? Aye. Sweeney? Aye. Todd? Aye. Woolsey? Aye. Wu? Aye. You? Aye. Motion passes. So uh, I know we're late for lunch, but I think we could take a quick lunch break, to grab something to eat and bring it back. If we can be back by, say, 120, 125, possibly. Will that work? Very good. We'll see you back at 125.